Rhonda. Rhonda, Rhonda really, I tell you. She is, and in my case, I just nicknamed her Wonder Woman because she has done so much for this organization. She organizes all of our events and all. She does a wonderful job. Uh, as, you may, if, as some of you may know or may not know, uh, we started a couple of years ago. We started in the very beginning. We started a plant, a scallop restoration, and we moved to clams last year or two years ago. This past year, we got a grant, uh, and we're going to be putting a million clams in Sarasota Bay in 2020. I don't want to take too much time, but I need to say too that. Uh, the other hat that I wear that I'm not wearing now is the Suncoast Waterkeepers, this organization here today. And I joined Suncoast Waterkeepers Board a while back because I realized we can put 10 million clams in this bay. We can do everything we're doing. If we don't quit dumping sewage in our bay, um, then we're everything that everybody else is trying to do here is really for naught. So um, I applaud this organization for what we're doing. And we really, a really special guest here, Jack Davis here. I tell you, I've lived here since 1981. After reading his book, it was like, wow, I see a place I live now with new eyes. Thank you. Thank you, Rusty, and thanks for what you do. And, and part of what we try to do at this brunch is not only talk about some of those waterkeepers, but try to give an opportunity for other organizations to... Uh, say a little bit of what's going on because we have a lot of great organizations doing a lot of many things in this community which makes us a great community. Next person is Marilyn Parker. She wears two hats. She's also our treasurer. But Marilyn's been fishing game since I could recall about probably back in the 1980s but she has something she'd like to tell you about. Uh, first, I'd like to recognize Nick Baden. He's the other board member that's here from Manatee Fishing Games. Stand up, Baden. <laughs> um, but what I, two things I want to talk about. One is what Fish and Game has become. Uh, if any of you are old enough to have gone to a Taste of Florida out of the old clubhouse. Anybody here ever gone to Taste of Florida? The old, oh, look at you. Um, well, that, of course, as you know, the world came to that clubhouse space and we sold that property and we wisely invested it and as we've all aged we decided we needed to leave a legacy so we gave the money that we earned from that sale to the Manatee Community Foundation and set up the only two uh, foundation funds that are strictly for fish and wildlife habitat so if you belong to a non-profit organization and you want money to do a project you can apply to our group or to the Manatee Community Foundation, and most likely we will fund you. So uh, keep that in mind. The second thing that Dick Eckenrod and I have been actively involved in is uh, getting our county commissioners to put a referendum on the 2020 ballot for uh, a sustainable uh, fund for acquiring open spaces and natural places. And right now, Tomorrow, we will be having the, um, the consultant that we're working with, showing the county commissioners the polling questions that will go out. The poll should be completed by the end of March, and that will tell the county commissioners whether or not our community is hungry for taxing themselves a little bit more to make the sustainable fund. So hopefully, the next time I'm able to report out, I'll be looking at you to help our campaign so that we can win that uh, ballot initiative in 2020. Thank you. Thank you, Marilyn. One of the organizations that uh, couldn't show up today was Minnesota 88 with Glenn Compton. He's down with the flu bug, he told me, and so we wish him well. But Minnesota 88 is one of those great partners in our community that really holds people accountable, especially with the phosphate mining issues that are going on out in, in the world, and also they've been very active over the years. Uh, doing a number of things, uh, helping stand by this organization when we had to challenge um, the state or, or Swift Mud on some of their uh, unwarranted decisions. Next organization is League of Women Voters, uh, represented by Stephen Murphy. Stephen? Yeah. And then uh, Tim Lehman, I believe you said you wanted to talk a little bit, maybe just a bit about the Turtle Watch uh, organization on Lopo. Uh, good, uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, I'm representing two different organizations today. 
today. One is the League of Women Voters, and I am the chair of the Natural Resources Committee and work with Mary Lynn Parker. And one of the things that we're supporting is the county initiative to get more land under stewardship. Another thing that the League is supporting, which I'm very involved in, and I want to explain to you all, is the Manatee Clean Energy Alliance. You've already heard from some of our speakers about what they're doing to really save the bays, but if we pollute the bays, continue to pollute, we really can't save the bays. Well, the overarching issue for all of us is, if we continue to put carbon into the atmosphere, it doesn't matter what we do, the seas will rise and this will all be underwater in our grandchildren's lifetime. So that's a very critical issue. So the Manatee Clean Energy Alliance, of which I'm a member, and many others in this community are, is working on the Sierra Club's Ready for 100 initiative. And our goal here in Manatee County is to get the cities, county government, and the school board to begin going in a sustainable direction. By that I mean reduce, to be carbon neutral, which means put no more carbon into the atmosphere by 2040. In reality, it should be 2030 because things are moving very rapidly. And all the data I see every year means that we are more and more likely to see our Anna Maria Islands, Island go underwater in 20 years. And that's, if I live as long as my father did, I'll be alive and see it. So I would encourage you to get involved in this. We have a meeting tomorrow at 9 a.m. at the Manatee School Board. And we have a presentation from a, uh, an executive from the Osceola School Board who has, they built the first solar powered school in Florida. And we would like Manatee County Schools, when they rebuild the Sug, is it called Sug? Sug, Sug uh, Elementary School, they're going to rebuild that. And we want them to go solar. We want them to set an example for this area and go solar. So tomorrow we will learn how Osceola County did it, how much money it's saving them, and how much carbon it's preventing from going into the atmosphere. It's at 9 a.m. tomorrow morning at the school board building uh, downtown. Thanks. Thank you, Susan. Thank you, Thurman. I'm with the uh, Good afternoon. How are y'all doing today? Everybody okay. changed their watch and got here on time, right? <laughs> Very good. My name is Tim Thurman. I'm president of Lombok Key Turtle Watch. Um, we're a small volunteer organization focused on sea turtle education and awareness. Everything that they need, the habitat, the beaches, the water, everything that they need so they can survive and prosper. That's what our organization focuses on. We love to come out and do education and outreach. So if anyone has an organization that would benefit from someone coming and talking, there's some really good education materials. We have some good videos. We put out a good presentation. We're always happy to come out and talk about sea turtles with any group. We also help Boat Marine with the permits that are in place. We help monitor the beaches out on Longboat Key. We monitor it all up and down. I met there's a gentleman here from from Anna Maria. We have great nesting out on the beaches. Any morning, anyone wants to come and experience turtles. Let, let any of us know, longbookyturtlewatch.org, great website, you can let us know if you want to come walk with us, we'd love to educate the public, so thanks for all that Suncoast Water Keepers does, Justin and the whole group, my wife Allison's on the board now, so this is a great organization that helps the habitat, which will help sea turtles and many other wild animals survive, so thanks for what y'all do. Thanks, Tim. And now we'll uh, move to our speaker. Uh, we're very uh, interested in welcoming Jack Davis uh, this, this afternoon. He's the Pulitzer Prize winner of the author and author of the um, book, The Gulf, uh, The Making of the American Sea. He's also a professor of history and sustainability at the University of Florida. I'd like to welcome Jack Davis to Suncoast Water Team. <laughs> Sorry, Denise, you'll have to blank check up the <laughs> but, but darn it, you didn't sign it. And is it, was it Serene who's a pen I have? Yeah. So okay, thank you. Yeah. And so thank you um, for inviting me to uh, speak at your 
uh, event here, and they have this wonderful backdrop. It's always a treat to speak with the Gulf of Mexico at my back. Just to come and give you an idea of the love of the Gulf of Mexico around this country. Um, since this book came out in March 2017, I've given some 120 talks on the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, and I've turned down a lot. Um, and the and invitations come every week uh, to speak. I, I've spoken in Maine, in Massachusetts, in Chicago. I've been to Austin five times. Um, in a um, couple of weeks, I will be in either Corpus Christi or Galveston, but I will be in both of those places, Shreveport, Louisiana. I've been on the Mississippi coast at least a half a dozen times uh, giving, giving talks, and uh, up and down the Florida Peninsula, across the Panhandle. And it's just been phenomenal to, uh, to see how uh, people around the country just uh, very much care about the Gulf of Mexico and want to know more about it. I've given numerous radio interviews, Minnesota, South Dakota, everywhere. Uh, and so Americans are, are learning about this sea. And it's, and it's great to see. And I give, give talks to a number of groups like your own, and thank you so much for what you do. It's organizations such as yours here uh, uh, this afternoon that uh, give me hope for the, the future of the Gulf of Mexico, because you really, you truly do make a difference. I mentioned, I talk about this in the book, uh, in, in the epilogue. And uh, the difference that you make is in, in, in value. The Gulf would not be as healthy today uh, it, without you um, and your, your tireless efforts. But so what I want to do today is, and also just one thing I, I'd like to say, don't use the term red tide anymore. Get, wipe it out of your vocabulary. Mm -hmm. Because when you use red tide, even though red tide may be involved, uh, in what happened here a couple of summers ago. Uh, it's not the real culprit. And when you call it red tide, you're talking about a natural phenomenon. And you're giving our former governor, you're letting him off the hook because he can blame nature for what was happening. That's exactly what he did. Uh, and that's been going on for years. Newspapers, as I write about in this book, you know, uh, any sort of little accident or uh, algae outbreak in a bay or a sound or a bayou, they would automatically call red tide. When it, when it wasn't, red tide wasn't even involved. I've seen a blogger talk about red tide outbreak in freshwater lakes. <laughs> so let's stop and call it what it is, harmful algae blooms, blue-green algae blooms, whatever, but not red tide because then you're blaming nature and it's not nature's fault, uh, as you guys well know. Um, so anyway, sorry um, to lecture there. <laughs> so what I want to do today is talk, obviously, about the Gulf of Mexico, uh, share with you why I decided to write this book, uh, and, and, and also what my objectives uh, were, what I hoped that this book would do, uh, and what, uh, you know, what frame uh, the, the, my thoughts in conceptualizing uh, this book, and give you a little bit of history uh, about the Gulf of Mexico, and leave you with, with a little bit of hope. Uh, is, as well. And I'd like to start out by reading um, a, the opening of the book, a three minute excerpt from the very first words in this book, which are the very last ones I wrote. So the very first words are the last ones I wrote, I rewrote, I rewrote, and I rewrote. Um, and then I'm going to ask you, then I'm going to say a few more words and then ask you something about this. So it's not a test. Um, so, and some of you are familiar with it because you've read the book. In 1904, Winslow and Homer spent the month of January fishing midway up Florida's west coast, where the Homosassa River quietly slips into the Gulf of Mexico. The painter laureate of the Atlantic had never been on the Gulf, and it delighted him with his natural palette of sea and shore, his color, movement, and history. Behind reedy coastal marshes rose a dense woodland, a jungle of green, as Homer portrayed it, where splaying airplanes and ferns hung in mottled sunlight, and the scent of aromatic cypress and red bay trees vied with traces of rotting organic muck. Homer likely listened for the double knock of ivory-billed woodpeckers sounding from interior corners, and studied the stealth pose 
of herons and egrets quietly fishing in the water. Its sweeping calm surface was the perfect vision of contentment, though a deceptive veneer over the restless energy below. Wherever Homer drifted with bait and tackle, the water beneath his rowing skiff was clear several feet to a grassy bottom, flush with crabs, mollusks, and a thousand living things unseen. Among the most scintillating of sights were fish in schools as long as freight trains running with the invisible gulf tide. Their imposing numbers invited eagles and ospreys that circled overhead, and the wading birds tending to the shallows. They invited Homer, too, on return trips for years after. He was 68 years old, trim as ever, mustached as always, and at the height of his fame as a painter, acclaimed for his Atlantic seascapes. Together, Gulf nature and the patina of the past aroused Homer's artistic sensibility. He was prepared for such moments. Wherever he traveled with rod and reel, he carried paints and brushes. As he matured as an artist, the native scenery migrated on his canvas and paper from backdrop to focal point. In many of his Atlantic seascapes, human subjects appear in detail, front and center, often in contest with spirited, sometimes raging seas that speak to nature's paramount authority. Retaining this forthrightness in a composition of the Gulf, where the water was often as unruffled as a mill pond, required adjusting the scale of complementary elements. Among several watercolors that Homer completed at Homo Samson, human subjects recede into a dab of color against a slate of restful water in a wall of green over which palm trees ascend toward buff clouds and into the center of each work. In one such painting, Shell Heap, Sable palms shade in the aboriginal mounds, spilling discarded oyster shells down to the water's edge, where two anglers float in a skiff, suggesting a continuity between the ancient and the recent. Like all of Homer's Homo Sassett paintings, Shell Heap conveys an intimate and vital connection linking humankind, nature, and history. I call this triad Homer's truth, and it lies at the heart of this book. So, <clears throat> I grew up on the Gulf of Mexico, um, up in the Panhandle, but in Pinellas County as well, which is one reason why I wrote this book, because I have this lifelong intimate relationship, uh, as many of you do in this room, uh, with, 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 with the Gulf of Mexico. But also in 2010, when I was searching around early 2010, I just finished a, just published a book on the biography of Marjorie Stellan Douglas. And I was looking around for another book to write. And it occurred to me to look at my backyard. I wanted to write another book about a place. The Marjorie Stoneman book, the Marjorie Stoneman Douglas biography is as much about the Everglades. It's really a dual biography. Much about the Everglades it is uh, Marjorie Stoneman Douglas. You can't write her story without writing the Everglades story. And I really liked writing a biography of a place. So I looked at my backyard, and there was the Gulf of Mexico. And I discovered nobody had written a comprehensive history of the Gulf of Mexico. And I found that hard to believe. Uh, and that, you know, nobody had done this. But also the historians, my fellow colleagues, had um, let down the Gulf of Mexico. You can look at the U.S. history textbooks assigned in high schools and universities, and you are, there's a good chance you won't find the Gulf of Mexico listed in the index of those books. And if you do, it's only mentioned in passing in a couple of places within these U.S. history texts. So where's the Gulf of Mexico in the American historical narrative? It's not there. You know, the traditional American historical narrative, it's not there. Uh, and, and so I wanted to correct uh, this oversight uh, to show how the Gulf of Mexico was very much a part of the American experience. And I was very strategic in choosing the subtitle of this book the Making of an American City. The book focuses on the five U.S. states, um, but I call the Gulf of Mexico an American Sea. And I was very strategic in doing that uh, because I didn't want anybody to think the Gulf was merely a regional <coughs> city. Um, <coughs> and if, then it's not, the book wouldn't have gotten any attention. I, got a, you know, I was able to get a uh, book agent. I was able to get a New York publisher. If they thought this was a regional history, they wouldn't have been interested in this book. I had to make it an American history. But I truly believe it is an American history as well. I wanted my readers, and I always envisioned 
this book to be written for a general audience. I don't write books for academic audiences. You write an academic book, sure, there are a number of you in here who have done that. You write an academic book, what happens to it? It ends up on the cold steel shelf in an academic library. Uh, and then you do the $20 test. You go into the library, you pull the book off the shelf, turn to page 100, you put a $20 bill there, put the book uh, back, you return 10 years later, and you get your $20. <laughs> Without interest. <laughs> and, you know, why? And th this subject was too important uh, to be confined to academic libraries. Uh, in 2010, what happened? We're coming up on the 10th anniversary. Of course, it was the Gulf of Mexico oil spill, the BP oil spill. I should say, the 87-day nightmare in the summer of 2010, which the Gulf of Mexico was headline news every day alongside oil. Even today, you can go online, you can, you can just Google Gulf of Mexico, and you're going to come up with oil, references to oil. Uh, and I thought that was unfair, that the media had stolen the Gulf of Mexico. Having grown up in the Gulf, I knew what this sea truly was. It wasn't an oil sump. But that's how its identity had been reshaped by the, by the media uh, and its popular identity. But not just oil. The only time the Gulf of Mexico really was getting attention when there was an oil spill and five years before the BP spill was what? Hurricane Katrina. So hurricanes and oil spills. And that's how Americans came to know the Gulf, had come to know the Gulf of Mexico as an oil sump or a hurricane alley or maybe a vacation spot. Uh, and I wanted you know, that my, my readers, again, I always envision a national audience for this book. I wanted my readers to know that Americans, that all Americans are connected to the Gulf of Mexico, both historically and ecologically. Uh, whether they've even seen the Gulf of Mexico or not. And uh, that this was more than, you know, an oil drilling spot. It was more than uh, a hurricane alley. There's much more. It had this wonderful, rich history. And I didn't realize how rich the Gulf of Mexico history uh, actually is until I started writing this book. It took me five to six years uh, to research and write the book. So I talk about historical connections to the American, the larger American historical narrative, all Americans. Let me give you an example. What is the biggest real estate deal in U.S. history? Donald Trump had nothing to do with it, <laughs> nor did Michael Bloomberg, but, but they would probably argue, no, mine, mine's bigger, no, no, mine's bigger. Louisiana um, Purchase. Louisiana Purchase, that's right, 1803. So what do we read in the history textbook? That Thomas Jefferson, President Jefferson, made the deal with Napoleon because he wanted all that land west of the Mississippi to double the size of the United States so the American population would have a place to expand into, right? Well, yes, that was definitely a priority. But uh, equally important to Jefferson was to gain control of the Mississippi River, mm -hmm. which the French had control of because they had New Orleans. Whoever had New Orleans had control of the Mississippi River. But all the, all the European powers who had operated in North America and the Americans knew whoever controlled the Mississippi controlled commerce in North America because the Mississippi River reaches through various waterways all the way up to Canada. Uh, and you connect, so you can connect Canada straight down the Mississippi to the Gulf of Mexico, get a hop on the Gulf Stream, and zip back to Europe. Uh, take a week or two off your uh, sailing time crossing the ocean on the, on the Gulf Stream. Uh, and so Jefferson really wanted control of the Mississippi River. But he also believed that the Gulf of Mexico was rightfully American Sea. The Americans had no waterfront property on the Gulf of Mexico at that time. But Jefferson believed that the, Mex that the Gulf of Mexico should be American. So he made that deal. He paid, what he paid for all that territory west of the Mississippi, which doubled the size of the United States, he paid double for New Orleans. Uh, and that gave us gave the United States its first Gulf Front, water, uh, uh, Gulf Front real estate, and that was the Louisiana Territory, 300 and some odd miles. Next in line, and, and from that point on, and not only did Jefferson want the Gulf of Mexico, he believed Cuba was rightfully American, and Cuba is where? It's located right there at the entrance of the Gulf of Mexico. 
And his belief was that anybody who ever controlled Cuba controlled commerce going in and out of the, of the Gulf of Mexico. And he advised every president after him until he died to try to acquire Cuba. And at one point, the Americans made a very attractive offer to the Spanish to buy Cuba. And the Spanish responded with the equivalent of the middle finger <laughs> and said, it would rather see the island sunk to the bottom of the ocean than in the hands of the Americans. What an insult. Um, and so we didn't get Cuba, but what we got after Louisiana was Florida, or the Florida, which had returned to the possession of the Spanish uh, after the revolution. And they had East Florida and West Florida. West Florida went, uh, reached all the way over to the Mississippi River and up into southern Alabama and southern Georgia, approximately up to Mobile and straight across. Uh, and uh, we got Florida courtesy of Andrew Jackson, who came down to, from left his plantation in Tennessee, came down to Florida in 1970, because he didn't like all these slaves who were running away to Spanish territory and, and being granted sanctuary. Uh, and hanging out with the Seminole. He hated Indians, he hated, uh, he hated unfree, or he hated free blacks. Uh, and he hated the Spanish. So he came down, and there's some question about whether he even had permission from Washington to do this. He came down to Florida, and he ultimately wrested the Floridas away from the Spanish. Uh, and forced them to the negotiating table to give up Floridas to the United States. Um, and after he did that, he turned around and told his, this was an international scandal. He is, uh, he's invading, you know, foreign territory, plus he executes two, he invades the Spanish territory and he executes two British citizens in Spanish Florida, uh, who he accused of trading with the Seminole, uh, being in collusion with the Seminole. But after he wrested the Floridas away from Spain, uh, he turned around to uh, the leadership in Washington and said, give me the money in man and I'll get you Cuba too. Uh, and again, this is an international scandal. In Washington, they said, back off, Andy. Go back to uh, the plantation. We'll put you on the $20 bill. <laughs> but thank you. And, and of course, the Floridas gave us Alabama or the rest of Alabama. Lower Alabama and, and Mississippi as well. Next in line was Texas, uh, which the U.S. acquired in 1845, um, the same year that um, Florida became uh, a U.S. state. Jefferson always said that Texas would one day be a part of the United States, not only one day part of the U.S., but the, the, the wealthiest uh, state in the Union. It wasn't far off. So, and that completed our waterfront portfolio. The United States occupies almost exactly to the mile half of the Gulf front um, and half of all the uh, Gulf front property, sharing the other half with Mexico and Cuba. Uh, and so there is, a, there is a historical connection. Connections are very important to me as somebody writing about what would normally be perceived as a regional sea uh, to uh, show that it's an American sea. But also as an environmental historian, I'm very much, as scientists are interested in connections and ecosystems, I'm very much interested in uh, connections and history. Uh, but, um, but also in ecosystems, because science is very much a part of what an environmental historian does. Uh, and not original research in science, but we have to understand the science. So, the, um, I open up this book writing, this is where my question comes in. I open up this book writing about Winslow Homer. Where was Winslow Homer from? Come on, there's got to be some Yankees in here. <laughs> there, Maine, right. Rouse Deck, Maine. Uh, and he, uh, so he's from Maine. I could have opened up the book with a a, uh, a, a, a Gulf, an artist from the, from the uh, Gulf of Mexico, such as Walter Anderson, who was from uh, Mississippi. I could open a book with uh, a writer from the Gulf region, uh, an artist from the Gulf region, 
somebody else from the Gulf region, but it, instead I choose this maniac, as they are called, uh, to open up this book on the Gulf of Mexico, who had never seen.